Okay, today I'm back in the uh, in the Mayfair Star Wars Mayfair shop with Tom Brownlee. Hello, Tom, Simon. Thank you very much for agreeing to talk to us. Now, you're the co-founder of BookieBashing.net, and are basically a bookmaker's nightmare. No, I wouldn't say nightmare. That's not quite accurate. So, I think there's a lot of um, toing and froing in the bookmaking business. You've got the punters, you've got the professional punters, you've got the bookmakers, and because money is associated in it. Uh, there can be a lot of aggression, a lot of people trying to hold on to their slice of the pie. I don't really see it as nightmare on Elm Street, what we're doing. I think it's a little bit more like a musical. It's a call and retort kind of thing at Bucky Bashing. We're sort of like the Blues Brothers. The community is the band that's, you know, on a mission from God. And yeah, we're, the bookmakers are just trying to send us to Juliet and we're trying to stay out. So no, I wouldn't say that we're a nightmare. Okay, so I'm going to talk just a little bit about your background and then forward it. Um, so you studied algorithms at university, right? But you didn't you didn't put them work to work straight away with uh, gambling. You put them to work working for the government. Well, I did seven years postgraduate research, and that was um, publishing journal papers, going around the world, talking at conferences, and really doing a lot of hard research into the field of um, decision making in mathematics. So this is multi-attribute decision making, how to make optimal decisions. And also prediction, because it was in the field of infrastructure. And so from there, I went to work in Westminster and specifically on the M25 infrastructure. And we would predict how the M25 would deteriorate. And we would advise to the government, if you spend money here, then in the long term, the life cycle is more optimal than not. And there's a lot of um, comparisons between that work of prediction and decision making as there is in betting, in gambling, in poker, and in sports betting as well. Okay, now you have to forgive me here, but algorithms, we hear a lot about them. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there like me that don't know much about them apart from the fact they're a clever right. computer program. So can you tell us in layman's terms, what is an algorithm? They're not even a computer program, they're just a set of rules. It's a set of rules for how you solve a problem. So you have a problem, and a lot of what we do are mathematical problems, and so an algorithm just states, follow these certain rules and you will get from your data sources to some sort of output, to a decision that says, have a bet, don't have a bet, this is value, this is not value. And algorithms take a lot of different forms. You can have algorithms such as genetic algorithms. They're a branch of what people call artificial intelligence, but essentially they're searching through hundreds of thousands of different options or millions of different options, and they're just trying to find the best solution. Or you can have slightly easier um, algorithms, which essentially say that horse behind us is 10 to 1. That's not a bet. No bet. So they have different forms of complexity. Okay, so it sounds like they're you know, perfect for betting. So when did you start to utilise your knowledge of algorithms into gambling? When I was broke, uh, funding my way through that research at university on the stipend of £6,000 a year didn't, uh, didn't provide the best life. And so back in those days, the online poker world was a lot easier than it is today, primarily because it was open to the American market and you could target certain tables to start making some money on online poker. And the algorithms really that in the decision making that formed a lot of what I was doing. Is this, this was back in the day where you're looking at certain ranges of poker hands and saying, how often should I be betting these, checking these, raising these, folding these? And um, that led to sort of a lot of, this, you know, back, back in these days before a lot of the theory was online, I started working on how do we come up with solutions to these mathematical problems that are profitable in the long run? So was your first foray into gambling poker, or were you interested in that before? Yeah, no, poker was my first foray. It was, um, you know, I, I was a losing sports better at the time because it was recreational and there was no thought that went into it. But um, poker was something that I was able to make some decent money from online, started playing live around the Midlands, um, and then went over and played live in America. Uh, you suddenly realise that playing live is a little bit easier. But again, it, it comes down to a lot of reviewing exactly how lucky you're running. Because when you're winning, you can be winning because you're, you're good and doing the right things. You can also be winning because you're bad and you got lucky. And so the mathematical framework comes into were you lucky or were you good? 
you know. Yeah, and then you, you told me before we did this interview that you got to a fairly high level, sort of £10,000 sort of buy-ins or whatever. So, but then you started sharing your knowledge. Why well, did you do? yeah. I mean, this comes back to the academia, which really drives people to sharing information, sharing knowledge. There's a lot of drive in the engineering industry of getting people together in conferences and discussing ideas. One of the worst thing in the engineering industry is collaboration. You often get things going wrong and everyone starts blaming each other. And so there's a huge drive for get together, have conferences, publish your papers, get them peer reviewed, have people go through them and um, critique them and say, you know, I like your idea, but this doesn't look right and this doesn't look right. Now in the gambling world, that doesn't exist so much. There's, a, there's something called the tragedy of the commons. The tragedy of the commons is there you are betting on your particular edge and you're making some money and it's great. But now a few people have heard about it, so they come and they graze on the grass as well until there's so many people grazing on the grass that the land is no longer viable and all the sheep die. Or in, in the gambling world, so many people are betting on it, the bookmaker can notices that he's now losing some money or, the, or your poker player opposite you realises that he's got a leak and they patch it. So it's not intuitive to share information in the gambling world, in the poker world, or in the sports betting world. However, I came from a background where sharing information was paramount. And so I started trying to drive a lot of um, strategy sharing and mathematical framework sharing on um, sites such as the 2 plus 2 poker forums back in the 2000s when they were very, very active and start getting a conversation around, okay, by sharing this information, we are making everyone a little bit better, but I'm now going to encourage you to share your information and to critique me because maybe you'll see something in me that I'm doing wrong that I can improve. And it's that kind of relationship that you really want with people because no one can figure all of this out by themselves, you, unless you're Patrick Veitch, perhaps. But um, for me, definitely, it was beneficial for me to go, I've got a few good ideas and I'm going to share them with you. And I'd love to hear your feedback on my ideas and your ideas as well. And I found over, the t over time, the more you share, the more you do attract people towards you that will share, you know, their good information with you. Okay. And it was, um this is my ignorance again. Um, one of the things you shared was an equity graph. What's that? So an equity graph uh, takes very many forms. Traditionally, it's a time series um, and you would put a strategy, a betting strategy onto a time series and you would predict uh, how much money you would make or lose over time with this strategy. But I like to take it a little bit further. Um, so uh, I can give you an example of a golf equity graph that I like to produce just now. So in a golf tournament, you may have 160 different golfers ranging from nine to one up to a thousand to one. And they all have relative strengths. I mean, there's a lot of statistics around driving accuracy, greens and regulation, strokes gained off the tee and so on and so forth. And you can take everyone in the field and compare them to each other. And if you do this, if you compare all golfers to each other, you can plot a graph and you can kind of identify what's known in portfolio theory as an efficiency frontier. This is a, a boundary of golfers and all of them are good relative to everybody else in their price range in the field. And you can take one of these poker equity graphs and as long as you can get the right price, which is another problem, but as long as you can get the right price, you should find that you are profitable in the long run. So an equity graph is really explaining visually to you either how successful your strategy should be or it's making data jump out of a, a graph and assist you with your betting. Okay, so at what point did you realise that um, working on the M25 was a waste of time and you needed to get into this gambling luck? Um, there was a significant issue I was having. Uh, the civil engineering world is besmirched, unfortunately, with um, getting away with not paying their professionals the same amount as they do in other industries. And so I was quite well qualified. I am a chartered um, civil engineer and I did seven years of postgraduate work and I've got all the letters after my name. And still I was returning multiple times my career income through gambling winnings through 2008, 9, 10, coming up through the 2010s. And unfortunately as well, the civil engineering world is a world where 60, 70 hour weeks are expected. And um, I remember being sat in the office 
and uh, a particular horse came in on a, on a Thursday afternoon and that one horse profited more than my entire month income. And at the same time, my daughter was born and I'm sat in the office and not at home with her. And it, it no longer made sense to me. I, I actually asked my director, I said, um, can I take nine months sabbatical from work to figure out what I want to do when I grow up? And he said, um, well, what are you going to do for the nine months? And I said, probably gamble and spend time with my children. And he said, don't write that down on the form. Write down on the form you're going to do an accountancy course. And I think at that moment, this is back in 2014, I stared around and I thought, I can't do this anymore. I, said, I know what I like. I know what I enjoy. I know the problem solving. It is the same in civil engineering, but it just doesn't pay enough. So I left, um, I left consulting the government back then, and I haven't looked back since, to be fair. <laughs>